All right, so we're going to do five practice rounds. Some of these texts um, we've looked at in their entirety in previous weeks. Today, I'm going to look at one paragraph from the text, look at what not to do, and then what to do. And before we do that, when I say what not to do, you can sneak out a five and even a six by doing it the wrong way. As long as you don't misanalyze and like have some good analysis, you, you can still get college credit. It's going to be tough to get that four or five, though unless you shift to that what is worth writing about mindset, not just the mere matching game mindset. All right, so this is the luckiest man speech. We looked at this, um, I think it was just last week, uh, by Lou Gehrig, July 4th, 1939. This was when he was basically retiring because he had ALS, and he was addressing the fans um, at some point during in Yankee Stadium during Lou Gehrig Appreciation Day. So they had been rooting for him for years. He had been an all-star for years. Um, and now he has to quit the game because his body is shutting down. So one paragraph that um, I pulled out to look at today. Let's read the left. And then, again, what's on the right is the matching game, what not to do. All right, so Garrick says in, in his speech, when you have a wonderful mother-in-law who takes sides with you and squabbles with her own daughter, that's something. When you have a father and a mother who work all their lives so you can excuse me, have an education and build your body, it's a blessing. When you have a wife who has been a tower of strength and shown more courage than you dreamed existed, that's the finest I know. So many students would see this paragraph and say, okay, this is what I see. He uses emotional appeal. Uh, he certainly uh, is, is wanting us to feel like happy for him, right? He's grateful. He's showing gratitude. All right, he uses repetition. And in, in fact, it's not just repetition. It's anaphora. If you don't know what anaphora is, you're fine. If you do, great. You can use the specific terminology. But you can't write a whole body paragraph on anaphora uh, super, super effectively. So anaphora is the repetition um, of a word or phrase at the beginning of sentences or like clauses. So when you have, when you have, when you have, that'd be anaphora. That's certainly a, like a strategy he does intentionally, but that's not a body paragraph worth right. That's not like a whole lot of analysis that I'm going to be able to pull out of that. Some students might even say, yeah, I see hyphens. Okay, this is not a matching game. Do not worry about just labeling strategies or, or labeling fancy terms. I don't want you all spending a lot of time if your teacher gives you a rhetorical device list, like stressing out about those because then you're stressing out about the wrong thing essentially. Sure, if your teacher asks you to memorize them, memorize them. They're not bad. I, they just often, so many students see that. It's like, okay, I know what an anaphora is. I know what a um, juxtaposition is, all of those things, right? That's great to know. But if that's where you stop, you're stopping way too short. So here's what to do instead. Look for the writing trend. Again, the sentence on the top of this would be my topic sentence. Gehrig highlights the many blessings that surround him. I might flesh it out in, in terms of a topic sentence, but that's what would be in my topic sentence. Now think about it. All of these things that I pointed out in the matching game go with that writing trend. The repetition of when you have, when you have, when you have is actually building upon itself to highlight the many blessings that surround Gary. In his sentence structure too, right? It's an anaphora, um, when you have, when you have, when you have, the hyphens. They're all working together for the writing trend. What's worth writing about here is not anaphora alone. It's Gary highlights the many blessings that surround him. Um, and obviously the emotional appeal that we've recognized is just highlighting the many blessings that surround him. Now, I have a secret for you. You can write a nine essay and you can analyze what we just talked about without using the words anaphora or pathos, etc. It's not about terminology. If you got them in your tool bag, you can use them. But if you don't, you're not really that in trouble uh, for rhetorical analysis. All you've got to do is, again, go back to the rhetorical triangle. Think about where is the audience before they read the speech or hear the speech, and how does the author try to get them on his side? So for here, um, Gary would, Gary's actually getting the head of his audience. The audience is like sad for Gary. Uh, they're sad for themselves because one of their favorite players is going to have to be retiring. But really, they're sad for him because like he's at the top of the game and he has to stop playing. He recognizes that they're sad, but he says, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't need to be sad for me. Look at all these great things. 
in, in my life. So he recognizes where they are. So I'd say that all in my essay, in my body paragraph. Um, and then he does this, all of these things deliberately to say, okay, I don't need your pity. I've actually got quite a lot of awesome stuff going on in my life. All right, so we're going to do uh, five practice rounds today. Here's the second. We touched on this a little bit last week as well. This is the rhetorical analysis prompt from 2015. I did score this one um, in 2015. So I, I saw, I'll tell you exactly what I saw with um, Cesar Chavez's text. We're only going to read one paragraph of it today. This was published in a religious magazine on the 10th anniversary of the death of Martin Luther King. So I'm already thinking about the audience. They would have revered Martin Luther King. He's been dead for 10 years, but they, they witnessed um, a lot of the changes literally as they were happening that he led. It's a primarily religious audience because it's in a religious magazine. So I can just kind of take that leap there. Now, let's go ahead and read uh, one of Chavez's paragraphs. He says, thus demonstrations and, demonstrations and marches, strikes and boycotts are not only weapons against the growers, but our way of avoiding the senseless violence that brings no honor to any class or community. The boycott as Gandhi taught is the most nearly perfect instrument of nonviolent change, allowing masses of people to participate actively in a cause. So I'm just looking at one paragraph, um, but this paragraph is a good is a good one that kind of represents a lot of what he does in his speech or his essay, I guess we could say. Um, so many students in 2015 wrote an entire body paragraph on an allusion to Gandhi. This is the only time Gandhi was mentioned in the speech. The boycott, as Gandhi taught, is the most nearly perfect instrument of nonviolent change. Now, to be fair, Chavez certainly deliberately cited Gandhi, or referenced Gandhi, but that's not worth a body paragraph. He's got so much bigger, important things happening. That could be part of a body paragraph, but literally, I, I had so many. Uh, there was one other reference to King, and obviously it was on his, the anniversary of his death. I had so many students that I read wrote an entire body paragraph on Martin Luther King, like an allusion or reference to Martin Luther King, and then an entire body paragraph on an allusion to Gandhi. Well, most of the time they got threes or fours. Because really, what you're just going to be repetitive, and you're not going to be super thoughtful with your analysis. Really, all you're going to say there is, okay, well, um, the, the religious audience would like King, so by mentioning King and Gandhi, um, he would get them to agree. Like You're, you're not really going to say much more than that. So really, they were just kind of being really repetitive. Uh, they were quoting some long quotes, but not really analyzing themselves. Today, I want to focus on this is not a matching game. So many students talked about illusion, emotional appeal, pathos, even metaphor. Uh, we got a couple metaphors just in this paragraph. Weapons, boycotts are weapons. Uh, boycotts are instruments. That's all great, but that's not worth a body paragraph. Like, am I, am I really going to... Uh, write a whole body paragraph to talk about how he calls um, boycotts weapons and instruments. No, here is not the plan. This is not a matching game. Instead, look at the writing trend that I've identified. Chavez emphasizes the many benefits of nonviolence. That would be my topic sentence. Again, it might be a little bit more fleshed out, but that phrasing would be in my topic sentence for whatever, I'm whatever paragraph I'm choosing to analyze. The reference to Gandhi helps to emphasize the benefits of nonviolence. Gandhi lived it, right? And, and you could go on and think about his audience would know Gandhi was, you know, in the past compared to when Chavez was writing. So the audience would know, yeah, Gandhi was successful. So you can talk about that. Don't go on a tangent and talk about Gandhi forever. Talk about the audience forever. Talk, talk about the audience until you're like, okay, I really have nothing left to say. That's where you earn your points your, or your score. You're not earning your score by quoting. So tell me what Chavez does and then talk to me about how it impacts the audience. The emotional addiction is really just emphasizing the benefits of nonviolence here. And the figurative language are really, again, emphasizing the benefits of nonviolence. By saying boycott is the most, near, nearly, uh, is the most nearly perfect instrument of nonviolent change, clearly that's just emphasizing the many nonviolent uh, benefits. So I would talk about all of those things that students identified, but instead of having a body paragraph for illusion and then a random body paragraph for pathos and then another body paragraph for metaphor, I would tie it together in one body paragraph, just analyzing the section of the text, the reference to Gandhi, the diction, the figurative language, all work together 
And that's what this is all about, to emphasize the many benefits of nonviolence.